Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's virtual retirement seminar. Today is Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022. We are really glad to have you on today. Um, today's session, we are focusing a lot on our 12 month fee offers um, and information that's really specific to those that took 12 month fee offers. But uh, there will be information that'll be applicable for everyone. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Kim and Patrick to get started. Wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm told I look better with the mask on, but sound better with it off. So we're gonna we're gonna do this sound, and you can just cover up that corner of the screen. All right. There we go. All right. Welcome. We are Kim Coates Tuck, APFA National Retirement Specialist and uh, Patrick Hancock, the APFA Retirement Specialist Emeritus. We always give a shout out to Ron Harris, DFW flight attendant, because he's responsible for an awful lot of the uh, slides and information you're gonna see today. So, hey, Ron. We are not. This, uh, we are not the company. This is a union meeting. And uh, I have been a union rep long enough that I've developed a very healthy cynicism of my employer. And so if I say something about my employer that offends you, yeah, well, there you go. All right. We're also not your financial advisors. We're not your attorneys. Uh, we're not your Medicare advisors. We're not your Social Security advisors. You may find that you need some or all of these. You most likely should really talk to a financial advisor before you go ahead and do this. Um, but that's not us. So, but we are your union reps. This is probably our, our most favorite slide. Um, by people wanting to take a picture of it. Uh, we have 23,835 members as of November 2021. How many of those are over 80? Seven. Seven. And uh, that'll update uh, at the end of the month, actually. Uh, we have 111 over uh, 75, 79, 503, 1,536, 3,620, 60 to 64, and 5,471 in the 55 to 59, that happens to be the largest group. But if you add all of those up together, we have 11,248 people who are eligible to retire today. So if it seems like the uh, union is spending a lot of time, money and effort on uh, retirement and helping people get ready, that is why. Because an awful lot of our membership is there and thinking about it, and perhaps more importantly, should be thinking about it. All right, let's look at the rest of this, round that out. We've got 2,800, 1,576, 936, 1,370, 3,000, 2,500, and uh, uh, 259. However, we had a new class come on the line, was it yesterday? So um, I'll bet that number has popped up quite a bit because they looked awful darn young in that photograph that I saw <laughs> on our website, so yeah. But yeah, that's uh, that's who we are in our distribution. Kim, what can you tell us about housekeeping? Okay, housekeeping. The good slide handout follows our presentation. So if you have a copy of the good slide handout, uh, you you don't really need to take notes. And the good slide handout has been being updated multiple times since the beginning of the year. So once again, it will be updated um, and available on the website. Um, by the end of this week. Questions, submit them via chat. We have a few so far, but we're willing to take more and we have stopping points for questions throughout the presentation and we'll have more questions at the end if they come in during our presentation today. Checklist. All right, the good slide handout has a bunch of very useful checklists um, in the final pages. If you're going to retire in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, it tells you what to do, tells you what to do in the 30 days following your retirement, things to think about, um, very useful. Also, there's a contact list for all your benefits contacts, and of course, your most important contact at, of all, which is retirement at apfa.org. We can steer you in the right direction to most anything you need to know about retiring from American Airlines. All right. So important questions for VOP holders. We've got, what do you get in VOP retirement? What about income? I think we missed one here. We oh, did. And what and else? I'm, I'm going to go back here. There we go. Yeah. 
what day do I actually retire? This is important for the people who took the VOP. Um, what you get in VOP retirement and what about income? Finally, what else do I need to research? That's what we're all going to be covering in our presentation today. So what day do I actually retire? If you took the April VOP, your uh, last day as an active employee is going to be March 31st of 2022. And your first day of retirement is going to be 4-1-2022. So if you're putting in for your pension, that would be the start date of your pension, your retirement date of April 1st. Uh, pensions for both the PBGC and um, the legacy AA pensions pay on the first of every calendar month. And that would also be the date to start Medicare if you're switching to Medicare and or go on your spouse's benefits and so on if you're not doing the active rate COBRA from AA. All right, any questions for this section? I think we had a couple, Josh. Yes. All right, well, we'll get more information about the survivor packet. I'm very interested in this as it sounds like a great tool that is geared towards our work group. Any coordination with AA Federal Credit Union? If not, can there be? All right, so the survivor packet is something that's been in the works for a while now, and uh, we keep having a lot of retirees and we're a very small department, so it's, you know, it comes behind talking to people on a regular basis and answering their questions about retirement. But I hope to have it done by the end of probably like by the next um, quarterly meeting, which we have a board meeting next month and the next quarterly meetings like in May or June, I think. So sometime in the spring, I should have that done, if not sooner. Um, it's going to have just resources that you can leave a list for your family members if something happens to you, either while you're still employed by the company, who to call, um, or after your retirement, you know, who to contact about survivor support from the company, pension benefits, 401k, so on. So it's just a, use, a list of useful contacts for anyone who survives you in the event of your death. And we are working on that. Um, we could put the credit union as a contact. And obviously, we do communicate uh, with the credit union reps at each region around the country. And if they have any suggestions for something to put in there, we would get that from them as well. So that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, next question. I'm considering retirement. I would like to know if I begin the retirement process on unexpected factors may arise, can the process of retirement be stopped? Okay, well, the process for retirement is pretty basic. You notify your flight service manager of your intention to retire normally between um, 30 days out and two weeks before your intended retirement date. Um, in theory, any time before that retirement actually takes place, you could contact your manager and ask them to rescind your retirement. But I wouldn't leave it till like one or two days before because you have to contact the correct um, person in flight service to get that done. But yes, technically in theory, you can rescind your retirement. Once the retirement's gone through though, it's no longer possible. So after the date of your retirement, you can no longer rescind it. Um, next question. We uh, get this one pretty much every time. I'll take I'll take this one. Any chance of another VIA? Um, at this point, the company has not indicated an interest in another VIA. In fact, with all of the new hires that are being hired on, it's becoming more and more unlikely that uh, a VIA will be offered. All right, that's all our questions for now. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what do I get in retirement, including the added benefits for those who took the VIA. Um, what do you get in retirement? You get your travel privileges. Um, that's linked to be, being uh, uh, eligible for the 65-point plan. And we'll talk a little bit about that. You get paid for your vacation and sick time. You get a retirement gift. Fabulous. You get the status of being a retiree. 
And you get the option to purchase some really expensive uh, medical insurance if you're between the ages of 55 and 65 and not yet eligible for Medicare. So travel benefits. You get your D1, D2R, D2P, D3, and 20% off Advantage tickets. Um, all non-rev travels booked through non-rev travel planner, just like when you were active, but it's accessed through the retirees website, which is www.retirees.aa.com. Service charges and taxes are charged to your credit card, just like they are when you're active. Um, a pro tip we like to say is for you to have your D3s enter their own credit card. That way you don't get dinged anytime one of your D3s travels. Um, your Z fares are booked through the My ID travel link, just like on JetNet, but it's through the retiree site. Unfortunately, and this is so sad for those of us, when we retire, no more KCM, no jump seat authority. That makes a lot of people think about delaying their retirement. So I'll never get on. <laughs> but people do. I just did a Europe trip and I had retiree D2Rs and D3s that made it to Europe. And I think there was even a D3 in first class, which is very rare these days. All right, so there's non-rev friendly travel agencies such as Perks and Dargal. You can take a cruise. Uh, Ron Harris, our former retirement specialist did so. And he said, if you're feeling a little bit down, it's the best thing you could ever do because you're gonna be the youngest and cutest one on the whole ship. And he had a great time. All right, so another tip for those of you that are considering retirement, probably about you know six months to a year out if you're, uh, Global entry slash uh, pre-check, TSA pre-check comes up for renewal. Get it renewed one more time on the company dime before you retire. Of course, this is subject to timing, but you know if you're if it falls within the window that you can get it renewed before you retire, do it and get it reimbursed from the company one more time. All right, so VOP passes travel. You get eight round trip positive space passes if you took the VOP. Um, those passes expire five years from the date that your VOP began. So for those uh, flight attendants that took the April lump sum VOP, it started on April 1st of last year, April 1st of 2021. And for those flight attendants that took the 12 month VOP, it also started on April 1st of 2021. That's not your retirement date, but that is the start date of both of these VOPs. So Five years from April 2021 is when those passes will expire. And we have requested the company to um, take away the expiration date for those passes, but so far they have been reluctant to do so. So we would, and we know that travel has been limited because of COVID and everything, but so far the company has been unwilling to lift the expiration date on those passes. Okay, so all positive space pass travels but through non-rev travel planner um, on the retiree site, just like all the regular um, retiree travel. There's no service charges, but um, imputed taxes are assessed for the imputed income value of the trip. Um, you can use the passes for all of your eligible travelers. Your other D2s um, do not have to travel with you, but if you're Using it for a D3, they would have to travel with the pass holder. Okay, um, you can find imputed income on non-rev travel planner. There's a little chart, kind of shows you where to look. You enter the city pair, um, the imputed income of the trip is displayed. So you can find out how much you're gonna be charged for that particular trip. Um, so you can see in this, in this example, it's displayed up in the corner um, for a, what is it, Dallas to LA trip. There you go. So it gives, you a, gives you an idea of where to look for the imputed income if you want to check ahead of time. All right. So again, you can get your D3s to pay you back for that. Mm -hmm. Sick and vacation time. Your unused sick is paid out at a rate of $8.65 per sick hour. Um, that's not as good as using your sick time when you're really sick prior to your retirement. And Patrick and I like to point out that after a certain age, 
you normally have one or two things that need to be taken care of prior to your retirement, if at all possible. Um, you'll get more out of your sick time if you're able to do this before you retire. Um, because this is termination pay, it cannot be deferred into your 401k. I think we had a question about that, and the sick time is not eligible to go into your 401k. Your unused and accrued vacation is paid out at four hours per day at your rate of pay, as long as you have at least seven days of vacation or more. If you have less than seven days of vacation, it's paid out at 3.5 3 hours per, pay at, per day at your rate of pay. Retirement gift. Um, if you're not a VIAP person, I think if you're a VIAP person, this is done automatically. A list is sent over of people that need retiree gifts catalogs. But if you're a regular retiree, you need to contact your manager within 30 days of your retirement and remind them that they need to request your retirement gift catalog. The catalog comes with a commemorative certi certificate of your, uh, your years of service. Uh, make sure they've got your name spelled correctly and they've got your years of service in there correctly. It's frameable and you might want to put it up somewhere. Proudly dis display your years of service with the airlines. Also, some options as gifts include uh, some lovely dust catchers, um, glass plaques, uh, jewelry. They even have a little charm from Tiffany's, I think. And here's an example of one of them that's very popular. Um, it's the airline tail. Patrick says you can never have too much tail, nice tail <laughs> around the place. <laughs> All right. When you retire, your status is going to change. Formerly, you've been known as a sky goddess. Now your status is going to change to that of cat rancher. Ah, All right. In line, oh, now I'm sticky. My slide's not going. Cat Rancher, we got to talk about that. Okay, so along with your status change, um, you're going to be able to get a retiree ID for part of your new, re to show your official status as retiree. Um, retirees can sit, submit an online application for a retirement ID. You just log into the retiree's website and up in the right-hand corner, it says, need a retirement ID? Click here and it will tell you what to do. You can also request that retirement ID prior to your retirement. There's a retirement guide on JetNet under team member services and then leaving American. And, and you'll see a like a seven step guide to retirement and requesting the retirement ID is included in one of those final steps. So you're going to request it prior to your retirement and they'll mail it to you after you retire. Um, you can use it for discounts on shipping, your FedEx discount, oh, that, that's a big one that people want to keep after their retirement. Also, car rentals, hotels, a government-issued photo ID is still required for travel. So this ID is not necessary for travel. A lot of people think, oh, no, I can't travel until I get my retirement ID. But just like if you forget your AA ID, you can still use your driver's license and passport. You don't need this ID to travel. Um, access to the retiree site is part of your new status. So that's where you'll go to find everything you need as a retiree. You don't need to go to JetNet anymore and your travel, your paycheck information, all that is going to be on the retiree's website. Um, your employee pay portal, which is the current system, is accessible as well as archived e-pays or paperless pay information so he, because the government still wants your money and you still have to do your taxes. And there's detailed sequence history is no longer available on the retiree's website. So if you want to print that information out, you need to do it prior to your retirement. So do we have any questions for this section? We do. All right. How do we ensure that our sick time and vacation payouts go into our 401k? Well, uh, like we just said, your sick time can't go into your 401k because it's considered termination pay. Your 401k, um, every paycheck you get to adjust how much of your paycheck you want put into the 401k. 
So I suggest that like for your last paycheck in which you're going to get all the that vacation pay in, you adjust it to 95% of your pay to go into the 401k. You want to leave a little bit there to make sure your union dues get paid. Well, and you know, maybe medical or whatever. Um, but that's, I call the backdoor way to getting it into your 401k. Thank you. Um, one more. I've seen lots of info on our retirement website on Facebook about how long it's arduous the process is to go through to retire. Now, we should have started last fall. What do you recommend as the best way to go through this process? Can I just follow the checklist on the APFA website? And when does that need to be started? If I get stuck, who is the best person to contact with questions? Thank you. OK, I'll take that one. The process for retirement is really not long and arduous. Um, the process for deciding whether you're ready to retire and whether you have enough income to retire, that can be long and arduous. Once you've made that decision that you're ready, the process is fairly simple. Um, there's three things that you have to think about. One is if you have a pension, you need to request your pension paperwork. Um, that, the soonest that can be done is 90 days prior to your retirement date. So a lot of people don't realize that maybe you need to find old divorce paperwork or something like that when you do your pension paperwork. So we recommend that people request it 90 days out, but it's not required and it can be done in a month or so. You do have to request it prior um, to your retirement date. Um, so say you're going to retire on April 1st, you have to request it prior to March 15th if you want an April 1st start date for your pension checks. So you will request it between 90 days out and two weeks out from your retirement date and you're good to go. Um, so it's not that difficult. It's just a lot of paperwork that comes in a big package and when you first open it up, it looks intimidating. Um, so we talk about requesting the pension paperwork. The other thing that people need to think about is their health benefits, and we're gonna be going into this in more detail. Um, if you're going on Medicare, if you're over the age of 65 and eligible for Medicare, or if you're eligible for Medicare because you were previously on social security disability, you need to switch to Medicare because COBRA is always secondary to Medicare. So COBRA is not really going to be an option for you for your medical. So if you're going to med Medicare, you need to request paperwork from the company, usually about 60 days out. That will let them know that even though you're over age 65, you've had creditable coverage from your company, and therefore you're not going to be assessed any late enrollment penalties. We'll get into that further in the presentation. So you have to think about your pension paperwork, 90 days out. You have to think about Medicare, 60 days out. The last thing you want to do is notify the company of your intention to retire. They like you to notify them, as we've mentioned before, between 30 days and two weeks out. So 30 days, you notify your manager, I'm going to retire at the end of the month or the first of the following month. There's not really a retirement paperwork for you to fill out with the company. If you don't have a pension, you just notify your manager and then they're going to want something in writing from you. Usually they ask you to email them on your a on the AA email saying, um, this is my official notification of my intention to retire on such and such a date. It, and they want to know your last day as an active employee and your first day as a retiree. And that's pretty much it. So it's not complicated. There's just a few moving pieces depending on what you're going to do about health benefits and whether or not you have a pension. Um, this question says, what is the deadline for deferring 422 VOP vacation pay into 401k? By when must the 401k percentage be changed before the payout? If you're trying to get that uh, last paycheck, um, I would recommend that you do it um, between the 15th and the 20th of the prior month. Is there a better time of year to retire? Yeah, um, there is. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish, but um, rather than a, a time of year, um, there are a couple of different reasons to think about time of year. Uh, we'll talk about your FSA account if you have one. Um, 
You also want to make sure that you think about uh, in your health insurance, having to restart your health insurance. So for instance, if you have six months of Americans health insurance and then you switch to a spouses or Medicare or something, um, you're starting a new plan in the middle of the year. You're going to have a new deductible. You're going to have a new out of pocket max. So if you're spending a lot of money and you've met your deductible and you've met your out of pocket max, um, you might want to think about well timing it so that you don't have multiple uh, deductibles and out of pocket maxes in in uh, a single year. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, is if you have a pension, uh, you want to make sure that you retire at the end of a month and not the beginning of the month because you have to be retired on the first day of the month in order to qualify for a pension in that month. If you miss it because you retired on the second, they don't tack it on on the end of the back. When will the last paycheck be issued and when will the sick vacation time be paid? So the sick and vacation time is normally paid on your last paycheck with your wages. So if you're an April VOP person, your last VOP pay would come on um, April 15th and your sick time is normally paid out with that. Um, these days, the vacation's kind of running um, about a month after that. So about six weeks after your retirement date. So most people will probably see uh, um, their vacation payout around on or around May 15th, depending where that falls in the in the week. So for the April V up, the last check is in March, so it's too late. This was uh, along. This was a tag on for the 401k question. The April 1st, you get a March paycheck. Um, April March, so we'll come on April 15th, I think. You get paid for March, yeah. You get paid for March. And remember, your March pay comes in two checks on March 30th and April 15th. So your last paycheck, active paycheck, will be April 15th, even though you're retiring on April 1st. Yeah, sorry, that was for the def uh, deferring 422 the vacation pay for the 401k. Right. Um, uh, the, do it within five days of getting the prior paycheck. So uh, you could do it between April 1st and April 5th to catch the April 15th check. OK, uh, do I still need to request the pension packet? And I don't think I do Medicare or COBRA, correct? Uh, I'm only 57. OK, you're, if you're 57 and you want to start your, if you're LAA or LUS and you want to start your pension early, because I think that's considered early pension prior to age 60 for AA and like 62 or 65 for PBGC pension holders. Um, you do need to go ahead and request it for an April 1st start date if you're a VOP person. If, but you don't have to start your pension just because you're retiring. You can wait until you're the full pension age if you would like to do that or you can start at any time in between. So your pension starting is not automatically linked to your retirement, although for the legacy AA folks, you do have to be retired in order to commence your pension. So just the general rule of thumb is request the paperwork 90 days out from when you would like to start your pension. And the pensions always pay on the first of the calendar month. And on the Medicare part, you're you're right. You don't have to worry about Medicare unless, of course, you're disabled. But you know that. Right. Um, and on the Cobra, you're eligible for Cobra. So depends on you know you want to make sure that you have the most cost effective uh, insurance. Cobra may be it, uh, considering you've got the active rate Cobra. And we'll talk more about Cobra later in the presentation. However, if you took the VOP, just remember that uh, you can't sign up for Cobra early there's always a trigger um, to, to be to being offered cobra so your trigger for being offered cobra in this situation will be your retirement so the cobra information will be uploaded to the retirees website under the benefits section probably two to five days after your retirement so you will go there after you retire to sign up for COBRA, or you can wait for them to send you a packet in the mail, but that will take a lot longer. All right, let's take two more and we'll continue on. This one's from Sue. Once retired uh, and I'm old enough to get Medicare COBRA, will I receive information about that? 
if you're retired and you're eligible for COBRA, well, the company will send out a packet if you're on the VIOP. I don't know in normal retirement other than receiving the COBRA packet itself that they send you a whole lot of information. Um, as far as Medicare, that's all on you. So if you're old enough to be eligible for Medicare, you need to research that process and get everything done in order to have a smooth transition from your AA active benefits to Medicare. And if you call us, we can give you some pointers and email you some information about how to do that. Uh, we need to request the packet even if we don't want to start it yet. No. You don't need to, if you're not going to start your pension anytime soon, you don't have to request the tax. Yeah. I spoke to Kim about rescinding and spoke to manager one month ago, and he told me it was too late to rescind retirement. Unless you're on the VOP, uh, call us because they're wrong. If you're on the VOP, it's too late. If you're on the VOP, you sign something saying, you know, it was irrevocable. A regular retirement, if you got in touch with management prior to the retirement date, It should you should have been able to rescind it. Okay, I'm seeing a couple questions about pensions come through, and I know we Those have some. That'll, that'll come down. At yeah, why don't we continue on and then wrap, uh, wrap around to these questions. Okay. So we covered those questions. Now we're going to talk about income. Patrick? What can All you right. tell us about income? Let's talk about income. In retirement, hopefully you're going to have um, multiple streams of income. Uh, for most of us, it's going to be the 401k, the IRA, Social Security, savings, and if you have a pension, uh, a pension. And I like to think of having multiple streams, like these five streams of income, as like having a five-legged stool. And the advantage to having a five-legged stool is that it's very stable. If one of those five legs gets kicked out from underneath you, it's going to hurt but it's not gonna de uh, destroy your life because you've got the other streams of income to rely on. Other, you lose a leg. Oh, I don't know, let's pick on social security. What if the United States Congress were to say, <gasps> you saved money on a tax deferred retirement account, you have a tax uh, favored pension, you don't need as much social security as somebody else. <gasps> they wouldn't do that. Oh yes, they would. Remember how Social Security used to be at, at 65 and now it's not? Yeah, that happened back when Ronald Reagan was president. Uh, he and the Congress decided that they could balance the budget by changing the Social Security retirement date or initiation date, full retirement date. Uh, and they figured that by the time we figured out how we got screwed, they'd all be dead. They were correct. I'm still pissed off about it. But even if you have one of those legs kicked out from underneath you, um, you're, you're in a much better position. I, whenever I look at this list, I am always grateful that I work for a unionized workforce and with a union that cares about making sure that my financial future is secure. And I compare and contrast that with the over 50% of people on Social Security that that's all they have. I mean, I try to think, what, what kind of life what kind of security do you have when your entire financial life depends on the good graces of the U.S. Congress? Yeah, no. Hey, what about my 401k loan? Well, we've got a couple of options. First option is you can continue to pay back the loan on your current amortization schedule uh, or just pay it off entirely. And uh, because you don't have a paycheck, you now have to uh, make sure that you get auto payment set up from your regular checking account instead of out of your paycheck. And the second, the second option is you can stop making payments and take the outstanding balance as a distribution, which will be taxed as income and subject to a penalty if you're not yet age 59 and a half. This is a really bad choice. Um, you should try and do something different. So 401k, well, last thing, a couple of things to remember. Your 401k is going to freeze for the first 30 days of retirement on your exit from the company. Consider rolling money out of your 401k prior to the uh, the last days if you're going to need money out of that 401k in the first 30 days. I, I do want to point out that if you need money, cash, out of your 401k in the first 30 days of retirement, you may not quite be ready just yet. Uh, you can roll your 401k into an IRA, uh, a new 401k, you go to get a new job, welcome to Walmart, welcome to Walmart. They're happy to have you roll your American Airlines 401k over into their 401k 
Or you can just leave it where it is and manage it through Fidelity, just like you've been managing it ever since it went to Fidelity. Go to netbenefits.com slash AA, and you still have all the same choices, all the same investments, and you still control it the same way. And if you've got some sort of outside um, advice coming in, you can continue to use that as well. Hey, your IRA, individual retirement account, uh, there's a pre-tax, there's a post-tax, um, the Roth. However, with the IRA, there are income limits. Uh, for uh, 2022, if you make more than 68,000 as a single or 109,000 as a married, uh, you're not allowed to make contributions. They phase out really, really quick. And uh, um, you can convert your 401k into an IRA. As a matter of fact, you are going to get solicited by a lot of people who tell you it's time to move your 401k. You don't have to, but they tell you that. And I'm sure most of them are not looking at the fact that they'll get a huge commission when you sell your stocks in the 401k and buy them in your their IRA. No, that wouldn't influence their opinion at all. But um, you, you have that option. However, I do want to point out that that's a one-way door, that if you roll your 401k into an IRA, you can never roll it back. It's a one-way door. And there are good reasons to uh, put your money into an IRA, but there are bad reasons as well. So you want to make sure you know what you're doing. Um, so for instance, um, the, the way people inherit an IRA is going to be different than the way people inherit a 401k. Um, the, how protected that is in case you're sued is different for a 401k and an IRA. A 401k is a function of federal law, ERISA, and it's 100% protected from creditors. Well, what do I mean? Well, say you run over the neighbor's chihuahua and they see you for everything you've got. They can't touch your 401k because it's, it's protected. Your IRA, on the other hand, is a function of state law. And it depends on what state you live in. Uh, I think it's Michigan where the first $50,000 is protected, but everything else in your IRA goes to the grieving chihuahua owner. So, yeah, uh, there may be good reasons to do it. But you want to make sure you know what you're giving up and you want to make sure you know what you're getting. And they're not the same. So what about those other ones? Oh, questions. I think we're going to skip over this one and do all the questions. Or Did we have a few 401k questions? Nope. Okay, let's talk about Social Security. Kim, what can you tell us about Social Security? Okay, Social Security. It may be taken as early as age 62, as late as age 70. There's no increase to after age 70, so if you're thinking about waiting, it's not going to get any more, so go ahead and take it or you'll leave money on the table. Um, you can go to www.ssa.gov to get more information about Social Security and all the different ways you can take it. Married couples have some complicated decisions to make on deciding how and when to draw their Social Security. I think as a single person, you have, what, 19 different ways to take it and 81 different possible ways if you're a married couple. Yeah. So talk to a Social Security advisor. There you go. They are available in every state, and uh, also there are apps for if you're a geek like Patrick and want to put something at your on your phone or your computer to figure out how to optimize your social security. They're there. Um, I'll probably just talk to a human, but Patrick will get the app. Um, early social security. What's what are the pros and cons about taking your social security early at age 62? We're going to kind of go through that. So if uh, you take it early, you're going to get more years of payments. Uh, you can get your money now if you need it. If you ended up retiring early for whatever reason, um, it enables you to increase your income in early retirement. Cons are you're going to get lower payments. They're not going to increase beyond what you started out when you started your Social Security. So they're not going to get bigger just because you get older. Um, subject to income limits, when you take your early Social Security, you can't make more than a certain amount over and above uh, Social Security without being taxed more heavily past a certain level of income. So if you are, are married to a spouse that's still gaining, earning a lot of money, or you plan to do a second job that's going to earn you a lot of money, you might want to reconsider taking your Social Security early. Um, or be prepared to take the taxes. 
So um, 19,560 for 2022 is the income limit. Um, after that, you deduct $1 benefits for every $2 earned. Um, the break even point for, for early Social Security versus later Social Security or normal retirement age Social Security is the average age of death, which this year is it has it it's gone down to 78 or 70 78.5 it was 79.5 but because of covid and other prescription drug issues it's gone down to 78.5 so that's where you would break even on your regular social security um, versus early all right so when should i start well as we were just discussing one line the first line shows someone who takes their Social Security early at age 62, that's the blue line. The red line, someone who takes it at 66, if they, that's their normal Social Security retirement age, and the lines cross at the average age of death. That's just an illustration of what we were just discussing. So, you know, if you're my grandmother who lived to age, you know, 90 and got a new car late in her 80s, she should have taken it at her full Social Security age. If you're one of Patrick's uncles who maybe died before they found out if their hair was going to turn gray or not, you know, or if they were going to go bald, they should have taken it early. So it depends on your family health history and how long you think you're going to live. Your guess is probably the best as far as that goes. All right, so full Social Security at your normal Social Security retirement age, which is your Social SSNRA and the pension documents and so on. Um, there are special one-time limits if you reach your Social Security retirement age, um, income limits for the year you reach your Social Security normal retirement age. So if you retire in the year that you turn 65, but maybe a few months before you turn 65, your income limit's gonna be slightly higher than if you took the early, regular early social security. And for 2022, that income limit is 51,960. So just in case you don't know when your normal social security retirement age, a uh, general rule of thumb, if you were born after age, I mean, if you were born after 1960, your normal social security retirement age is age 67. Prior to that, this little chart illustrates uh, 66 and four months. If you were born in 1956, for instance, so um, it's a useful tool to have if you want to figure out when your normal Social Security retirement age is. I'd rather not even think about it, <laughs> but we're all going to have to. All right. So, Patrick, what counts as earnings for Social Security? Well, that's a good question because you, you keep saying that we've got this earnings cap of 19 or 50. Uh, five in that year that we go. Earnings uh, include income from wages or net earnings from self-employment. You know, you've got some little side gig going on. They also include bonuses, commissions, severance pay. All of that stuff is going to count toward that cap, Social Security cap. However, earnings do not include investment income, pensions, capital gains, inheritance. Um, thus, the, the dividends and capital gains won't negatively affect your Social Security benefits directly, even if you decide to file earlier than your full retirement age. So you may have invested into, you know, dog, dog coin. And uh, so you've got all of this income coming in, but it's capital gains. So it's not going to throw you into the uh, special Social Security excess income uh, bucket. All right, taxes on Social Security. The first 15% of your Social Security is tax free. Even Bill Gates doesn't pay tax on his first 15% of his Social Security. You may pay tax on some of your Social Security above that. And you're either going to pay tax on 50% of your Social Security or 85% of the rest. Not, that's not your tax rate. That's how much of your Social Security is going to get taxed depending on your combined income. Okay, let's look at that combined income. So. Um, if your income is zero to 25,000 as a single, none of it's going to get taxed. So the first 15% plus none more. However, if you have income between 25 and 34,000, 50% of your Social Security will be subject to tax. We'll figure out what that tax is in a minute. 
if you make more than 34, 85 percent, because remember, the first 15 percent is never taxed. So 85 percent of your Social Security or everything but that 15 percent will be taxed. What about state taxes? Well, in 37 states, your uh, taxes, your Social Security is tax free. 13 states do tax some or all of your Social Security, and that's going to be uh, Colorado, Connecticut, Kansas, all those places. So you may want to be thinking about that when you think about well, where do I want to retire? Eh, one of these states may not be make the list because they're going to tax some or all of your Social Security. Savings. In addition to cash, stocks, and bonds, you may have hidden savings that you don't really think about. For instance, home equity. And I, I really don't, don't like the reverse uh, mortgages. I think mm -hmm. that's a, a scam business, and I've spent an awful lot of my time trying to get people out of uh, scam reverse mortgages, but uh, it's there if you need it. Life insurance, and by that I mean the cash value of any uh, whole life policies that you may have around, not the cash value when you bump off your husband or wife, have a good alibi. Um, oh, by the way, on the life insurance, the American Airlines life insurance is not whole life. It's term. There's no cash value there. Pensions. What can you tell us about pensions, Kim? Okay, so if you have a pension, which we like to remind everybody that not everyone has a pension these days, unfortunately, and for those of us that don't have pensions, our 401k is all the more crucial, and it's really important to contribute to your 401k. Um, especially if you don't have a pension. But for those who have pensions, um, it's going to depend on your a legacy carrier, where you started out your career, as far as when you can begin your pension. So um, for your legacy U.S. Airways, you're going to have one set of rules and different set of rules within those rules for people that started at Piedmont, U.S. Airways, Trump Shuttle, et cetera. And then there's another set of rules for those people who are eligible for legacy AA pensions. All right, for U.S. Airways, you could have started out your career any number of different places, as we can see here. And uh, we have a little chart that shows early pension age and full pension age for U.S. Airways pension holders legacy U.S. Airways. So if you started out your career at Shuttle, your early pension age is age 52. Your full pension age would be age 62. There's a reduction of 3% in the full value of your pension for every year that you take your pension early. And uh, if you took, the, you know, took it at age 52, that would be a 30% reduction in the value of your pension. Um, so, but for legacy U.S. Airways pension holders, uh, they did away with a rule that required you to be a certain age before double dipping. That means taking your pension while you're still working for the company. So as long as you're eligible and you're at the early pension age, you can start taking your uh, pension early while you're still working. There is a minimum years of service requirement, and you'd have to check with the PBGC to find out what that is. So. We talked about shuttle for Piedmont, Allegheny, U.S. Airways. The early pension age is age 55. Um, the full pension age is age 62. Uh, for PSA, early pension age is 55, and the full pension age is 65. So contact the PBGC if you need additional information. Um, they're the best go-to. And we have their number in our pension pack and our APFA retirement packet and also their website is www.pbgc.org or is it mypba.org? Uh, pbgc.gov. pbgc.gov. Okay. Should be. All right. So legacy AA pensions, different set of rules entirely. You cannot commence your pension until you have actually retired, unfortunately. So no double dipping with pensions for the legacy AA folks. Early pension age is age 55. Uh, full pension age is age 60. If you're retired and eligible to commence your pension, you shouldn't wait until after age 60 because it doesn't really get any bigger after that. Um, the same 3% reduction per year applies if you start your pension early. So if you were to commence your pension at age 55, that would be a 
15% reduction over the full value if you waited until age 60. So you, you just have to determine what's going to work best for you. All right, pension options. Patrick, how many options are there for taking our pensions? How many different ways can I get my money? Well, good question, Kim. There are three basic ways you can get your money. A uh, single life annuity, PBGC calls this a straight life annuity. But fortunately for us, the acronym SLA is the same because, you know, we're an airline. We run on jet fuel, caffeine, and acronyms. <laughs> uh, you can share with someone else. I do remind you it's nice to share. Or you can get a minimum number of checks. Um, there's a fourth option available for legacy AA folks, and that is the more upfront, less later, the level income option. Let's look at them. The single life annuity. Uh, or SLA, you get a check every month until you're dead and it stops. Questions? Yeah, no, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, the single life annuity is uh, the a, a payment every month is an annuity. We've got a lot of annuities in our lives, uh, mortgages and so on. Uh, for life means that it comes for your li a single one life. It's one life yours. So we call that the single life annuity. And the single life annuity is the normal form of option. Well, what, what do I mean normal form of benefit? Well, you know how when you're trying to do the planning on uh, whether or not you're going to have enough money in, in retirement, you have to think about, well, how much am I going to need? How much am I going to get from all of my resources? Well, the company has to think about those sorts of questions as well. But back when you started as a fresh young flight attendant, uh, they have to guess how long I'm going to work how much you're going to make? You're going to do fly much over time, and then they have to guess what what how are you going to take your pension? What form of benefit? And they assume that you're going to take the single life annuity. That that is the normal form of benefit. And once they figure that out, they have a number, and the value of that single life annuity determines the other payment options. Well, what about those other options? Well, let's look at. Uh, uh, it's nice to share a pension for your life and someone else's life as well. They'll get an annuity for their life after you're gone, the survivor annuity. You don't get two pension checks at the same time. You stop getting one and they start getting one. So they survived you. We call that the survivor annuity. However, remember, it's still the same big pile of money. We're just dividing it up differently. So you can choose to leave them between 50 and 100 percent of what you get, not just single life annuity, but what you get on the joint survivor annuity. But the problem is that uh, the more you leave them, well, guess what? The less you get. Dang it. All right. Well, I guess so. Okay. So, let's do these real quick. We're having some issues, technical glitches. Well, let me switch. Let's see if going to a mouse is going to help. Josh, help. Helping. Go backwards. There you go. All right. I'm going to see if my keyboard works now. Good. And I think we're there. This is where we froze. Let's see if it goes. How? But what if I say, yeah, I've got to leave Bozo something because otherwise I'm going to be living under a bridge. And uh, what happens if they die first? Dang it, I am stuck at that lower amount I took. I would have had more with a single life annuity. There's a technical name for that. You're screwed. Yeah. However, there is a way to cover that risk. And that is flight attendants have another option. It's called the pop-up option. And uh, by taking a slightly lower amount each month while you're still alive, you cover the risk that the joint annuitant dies first. With the pop-up option, if your joint annuitant dies first, um, you pop back up to the single life annuity amount as though you never selected that option. Yay! So <laughs> as as you've got a good alibi. All right. You're stuck again. Ah, and most people are going to take one of these two options. By most people, I mean, you know, north of 90%. But there is another option out there. It's called the guaranteed period certain. 
checks come for a minimum of 10, 15, or uh, 20 years on the LA, or 5, 10, and 15 years on the LUS side. Very rare that you'd ever do it. The only reason people would ever do this is if they're reasonably certain they're going to die soon and they want to make sure that they can leave something to someone else who's not their spouse. It's the only time I've ever actually seen that make any sense at all. Uh, it's nice to know it's out there, but it doesn't apply to very many people. Legacy AA has a fourth option, and it's the level income option. That's more upfront, less later on. Um, you may find that once you have your pension and your social security, that you're going to be okay, not great, but okay. But you may find that you leave before that. And now you're not okay because you need both. American has a deal for you. They say, tell you what, we will give you more upfront until either age 62 or your full SSNRI, social security, normal retirement age. And then after those kick in, we'll, we'll reduce your pension. And, you know, sometimes people, retire and didn't plan to or didn't plan. Um, yeah, I call it the sudden out. That's when your union rep and your supervisor meet you on the jet bridge. And as you're walking up the jet bridge, the union rep says, I got your retirement. I recommend you take it. You hadn't planned. So yeah, but uh, yeah, that's that's uh, available out there. Um, I'm not even sure it's actuarially sound, but if you're in a, between a rock and a hard place, you don't care about those things. You got to make, make the rent next month. It's important though if you do take that option to budget for when it will drop later on and yes. be prepared for that. So how do I apply for my pension? This is you. This is me. Yep. Okay. Pension tips. So you apply if you can request your pension paperwork as we mentioned before uh, no more than 90 days prior to the commencement date for your pension benefits. Um, for LAA, uh, you request your pension kit over the phone by calling the team member services number 1-800-447-2000. And uh, for legacy US folks, you contact the PBGC and here's the number I didn't memorize earlier, 800-400-7242 or go to www.pbgc.gov. All right. Um, Taxes on pensions. Patrick, All right. you again. You're going to pay taxes on your pension. Now, we're not talking about Social Security. Remember, we already talked about tax on Social Security. This is your pension. You're going to pay federal income tax on your pension at ordinary income rates. And that's going to be 10 to 37 percent, depending on how much you uh, your total income is. We can see in this chart that if you make uh, up to 19750 you're going to pay a 10 percent tax rate. Or if you're making uh, 622,000 or more, I can be single. Oh no, um, that <laughs> you'll be uh, at 37% tax rate. All right. All right. Gosh, I may need some help again. No, I'm going to do the. Oh wait, wait, trick. sorry. The there tip. we go. Remember, your mileage may vary. These numbers are used for some mythical flight attendant and not for you. Kim, pension tips. OK, so um, pension kits can be requested from AA or the PBGC no more than 90 days out, as we mentioned earlier. So that's kind of it's always good to get it earlier um, it, j just so you're not overwhelmed by the paperwork. As I mentioned before, it's really not anything that difficult. But when you first open the envelope, it seems like a lot. The hardest part of doing your pension paperwork is figuring out which option is best for you, which annuity option. Um, it's easy. You just have to figure out when you're going to die. <laughs> yeah. Tell me. <laughs> Maybe we need to have a psychic as part of our presentation. <laughs> all right. So, Instead of just a psycho. Oh, all right. Exactly. Instead of just a psycho. So pensions start on the first of the calendar month. So you want to make sure you request it. If you don't request it 90 days out, request it before the 15th of the prior month. Um, be done with your last trip before the end of the previous calendar month when you're retiring, because that can mess with the starting of your pension if you're still on payroll on the first of the calendar month. So when you're retiring, you always go by the calendar month and not the bid month. Um, fly through trips again could mess you up. Um, I think with PBG, uh, PBS, they pretty much remove you yep. um, from any trips post or during or on your retirement date, but why risk it? You know, so 
things don't They would never happen. delay getting me home when exactly, I plan to be exactly. home. No, so no, that would never happen. Just be conscious of it. All right, so have copies of your divorce decrees and quadros because uh, you'll need those for to be included with your pension paperwork. If your quadros are on file with the company or the PVGC, you may not need that, um, but you will have to sign something that says whether or not there are quadros associated with a divorce. And Patrick, why is quadro the you know, worst four letter words in the English language? Oh, no kidding. <laughs> what no does kidding. it stand yeah. for? <laughs> if you think you have a quadro on file, you'll want to double check and make sure with enough time to, to replace it in case they've lost it. Okay, so if you're a widow or a widower, you'll need a copy of the death certificate um, to, to return with your pension kit. The first month of the pension, it's good to know, is always paid retroactively because they don't process for the LAA pensions, those papers, until uh, you have actually retired. Normally, it takes about six to eight weeks on the LAA side to get your first pension check. So you'll be paid either two or three checks all at once. You'll get one big check, and then after that, it'll be like clockwork on the first of every calendar month. All right, any questions about pension? Yes, we've got quite a few questions in here. Um, the first one's actually a follow-up 401k. What happens to my 401k upon retirement? Do the assets remain invested in the same 401k Fidelity AA sponsored retirement account, or must they be transferred into a different type of retirement account? Or can I initiate a transfer of funds to another brokerage of my choice? I'll take that one, or do you want to take it? Yeah, there's like 12 pieces. Go ahead and take what you want to take. Okay, so your 401k will stay invested in all the same investments that you have. It is frozen for 30 days following your retirement date. That's just for administrative purposes. Um, after the 30 days are over, you can leave it with fidelity, and many people do. You can manage it the same way you always have, so you, you can change your investments around. Obviously, you don't have any more income going into it. If you get a new job with a 401k, you can roll that 401k into the next company's 401k. Um, if you choose to roll it into another form of investment, such as an IRA, you can do that as well. There's no time limits. So you could leave it with Fidelity for two years and then roll it into something else, or you could roll it into something else uh, right away. And if you're over age 59 and a half, you could roll in into something prior to your retirement. Okay. Hopefully I answered everything. I think you got it all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is my responsibility with regards to any required change of status to my 401k upon retirement? You don't have to do a thing. Uh, it is all automatic because there's really no change other than you no longer have the ability to make contributions, but you continue to manage it the way it's been. You get to decide whether or not you want to take money out. Um, you, you, yeah, no change. Are we able to do Roth conversions in 401k after retirement? Um, <laughs> yes, uh, well, no. Uh, you can convert from a 401k to an IRA and an IRA to an IRA Roth. Um, the, the the conversion of the 401k into a 401k Roth, um, I think, is limited to active employees because it, it, it's covered under your contributions. So pensions, we've got quite a few of those. Any words of wisdom on navigating PBGC for the LUS flight attendants? Is it possible to have a town hall on the PBGC process since it doesn't affect the whole group? Well, um, my, my words of wisdom are, um, Always start with a shot before you you uh, get into it. But um, the, the actually, you're not going to believe me, but the PPGC Customer Service Center is really helpful. You know, for a government pl place, they're really helpful. Um, you need to have the information like uh, your your employee number at the uh, when you when you, at the airline at which you accrued the pension. Um, you need to have your Social Security number. But once that can clearly identify you. They're pretty good at answering questions. Again, like Kim says, you want to do it 45 to 90 days before you want to start that first check. And as far as having a, a town hall on the PBGC pensions, um, 
we could do that, but we wouldn't even attempt to do that unless we could get a rep from the PBGC to join us for that town hall. Yeah. So if we are ever able to do that, and I will make some inquiries, then we'd be happy to do a town hall for PBGC pension. Any tips for tax with monthly pension draws? Yeah. Patrick. Um, okay. When you think about how much you want to take out of your pension, you have to think of the whole year. And uh, so, and also recognize that you can you can tweak it as you go through the year. So say you, you go back and you look at that uh, federal income tax on your pension and you say, okay, and actually, I, I wonder if I can get back there real quick. Yeah, taxes on pension. So look at this chart and say, um, you wanna say, okay, I want to stay, uh, there's a huge jump um, between, or there's a jump between the 12, uh, between 12 and 22%. So I want to keep my income below that 40 or if you're joint $80,000 so that I don't jump up from the 12 to 24, 22% on the next dollar. Now it's only on the next dollar, not the ones that you, so you might want to think about, okay, I'm going to have, uh, say $30,000 uh, from social security and I don't want to go over 80. So I need to limit my pension uh, or I'm going to have my pension payments. Uh, and my social security are gonna equal 50,000. So I need to um, limit how much I take out of other things like my 401k to keep below that $80,000. So that's, that's if you're not a geek like me, uh, that's probably a really good thing to go sit and talk to a financial advisor about. Definitely. Yeah. This one's for clarification. Did you say that the 401k can be changed to a Roth 401k leaving on 401? I, I'm going to direct you to the fidelity because I don't know what the time frame is, and you you're running out of time here. So I'm going to direct you to fidelity to answer that question. I think you could probably do it prior to your retirement. However, if you're changing from a regular 401k to a Roth 401k, there's going to be tax huge implications. tax implications because. So, what, say you convert a hundred thousand from the regular to a Roth, you now had a hundred thousand dollars worth of taxable income this year. So, uh, and depending on when you do it, there may be the ability to spread that out over a couple of that income out over a couple of years. Um, but yeah, don't don't just do it because you think it's a good idea because there are lots of tax implications with that. There's as well. tax implications up front, so really talk to a financial advisor, like Patrick said, if that's something you're considering doing. Is the pension from the account of AMR when frozen 2012 or AAL current? Okay, um, I think there's two two questions in there. One is where's the money? Um, American Airlines puts payments into the LAA pension. The LUS pensions are all with the PBTC. The LAA pension is held in a trust fund, and that trust fund is in State Street Bank up in Boston. Our layover is a hotel used to be across the street from it. <laughs> I'd wave at my pension from my room. And uh, every year, American is required to continue to fund that because they weren't able to get rid of it in bankruptcy. Uh, so uh, it is close to current. It depends on how you measure it. Uh, if you say I need to save a certain amount every year uh, so that I have enough money on the 10th year, if you're saving the right amount each year, you're current. You still don't have the total amount, but American is current on uh, their payments that are legally obligated to make. And as far as the AMR, AAL, our pensions were earned if we, when we worked for AMR. Right. And then AMR went into bankruptcy and disappeared. They changed the name to AAL. We didn't earn any pension dollars. Everything we earned was frozen in 2012. Correct. We are no longer earning pension dollars from AAL. However, under bankruptcy, they were required to continue to meet the pension plan's funding obligations. Correct. So did you cover, you cover the second part? What happens to money taken out of paychecks for pre-funding? No. Okay. Well then, no. what happens? What happens to that money that the LAA people were paying into their pre-funding uh, account? Um, there were two parts of it. One, you put a dollar in, and an American matched that dollar. The amount of money that you put in out of your pocket, you got back. The money that was mine that American put in, 
um, they got to keep. And they, as long as they used it to pay for other people's retiree medical benefits, which they did. But yeah. How do we request the pension paperwork? And is the full age 59? If, if I think this person may be a legacy AA person, the full pension age for legacy AA is 60. And the early age where you can start taking it is 55. And you contact team member services at 1-800-447-2000. You hit option one for active employees in the first menu. In the second menu, you hit option three for pension and retirement questions. And then in the third menu, you hit option four, which is for the AA pensions for everybody but the pilots. You've done that a lot. Done that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're, this is a LUS person, the early pension age, the full pension age is going to vary depending on your legacy character, <laughs> carrier, who are characters. <laughs> and uh, you need to refer to the chart that we have in our packet and you would contact the PBGC. What if I've been out on an IOD prior to retirement? Am I still able to receive pension? If you have a pension, your pension's always going to be there for you. Whether or not you even are eligible to be a retiree under the 65 point plan, when you reach the age and have the years of service, um, you can start your pension. So your pension is not dependent on whether you're active. It's not depending dependent on being a retiree, except for the fact that if you're a legacy AA person, you can't start taking it until you, you've left the company. You're no longer employed to, by the company. So say you don't qualify for the 65 point plan, but you so you'll never be a retiree, but you decide to leave and you have a pension, you, you're still eligible to keep that pension. Nothing can, they can't take it away from you. Yeah, and I think in the past we received a question, you know, what if I'm terminated? If you're terminated, still. and Patrick Hoy says, if you go to prison for stealing a 737 or it's triple seven, don't, don't go no, cheap, man. 787, then they're going to send you your pension check in prison. They can't take that yeah. away from you. Hey, Kim <laughs> is so nice. If there was any way that these <laughs> sons of guns could steal your pension, they would. Um, and therefore, there's no way they can get it. There's no way they can get it. Um, yeah, they can mess with, you know, whether or not you're going to be eligible to retire, but they can't mess with it. If I've taken the VOP, do I also need to request pension paperwork or will it come automatically? No, it will not come automatically. If you have a pension, even if you took the VOP, you need to request the pension paperwork. That's a great segue into this next question. <laughs> Where do we request the pension paperwork? I took the VOP, so have no supervisor, no JetNet access. If you took the VOP, you should still have JetNet access until you actually retire. You may need to reset your password. Um, you would contact the PBGC if you're a legacy U U.S. Airways pension holder or the, the um, number I gave previously uh, for team member services if you're a legacy AA pension holder. Is the automatic pre-retirement survivor annuity applicable for VOP and not starting pension until 2023? So I was discussing this with someone later, I mean yesterday, and it's still applicable if you haven't filled it out and you're retiring on April 1st. It's only the end of February now. You could still get hit by a bus between now and when you start your pension or when you take your VOP and want to start your pension. So if you fill out the QPSA form, which is only for legacy AA flight attendants, unfortunately, then your spouse could get up to 100% of your pension. So it, it's technically still applicable. Also, if you retire and choose not to start your pension and get hit by a bus before you start your pension, then that would still apply. Your spouse would get the pension, the higher pension benefit if that form is on file. Yeah, so if you're not starting your pension right away, fill out the form and avoid buses. Yep, <laughs> good point. Is there any advantage to starting the LAA pension at 60? There's no advantage to waiting until after age 60 because that's the full pension age. It doesn't get better. So there, the advantage is it doesn't, you don't lose anything. If I turn 60 on the second of the month, do I have to wait until the following month to begin pension without reduction? 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that and can yeah. I ding you for that one day. <laughs> yeah, if you turn 60 on the first, we're going to call it even. But if you turn 60 on the second, you got to wait for a month. If we wait to take pension later, as I'm only 57, when I get to the normal age, do I still just call team member services years from now to order it? Thanks. That is correct. There's an option uh, instead of option one for active employees in the first menu, you'll hit option two for retired employees. This slide instance says on VAP, we don't have JetNet. We have to use the retiree site. Oh, we that's true. It. That's true. You are. That's correct. I and stand there's, a, there's a link on there as well. Corrected. <laughs> Sit and stand. OK. Um, do we have to elect the pop up option by when must the election be made? When you get your pension kit, which is the paperwork by which you request your pension, you get a, a choice of all of those options that we just went through. And at that point, you would have to check the box. I want the joint survivor with pop up. Um, okay. I was told I can't receive pension because I was on IOD. Is there someone I can speak to because I need it? All right, if you were on an IOD and you don't have enough, each pension, the legacy US Airways side and the legacy AA side it has a minimum number of years of what they call retirement eligibility service that you have to have in order to start your pension. And I know on the legacy AA side, you have to have 15 years of retirement eligibility service in order to start your pension early between age 55 and 60. So if you don't have those 15 years of retirement eligibility service, they're not gonna let you start your pension early and there's nothing you can do about it. You, but you can start it at 65. Or 60 or if you have if 10 years of retirement years, yeah. eligibility service. So that's, uh, we can look into it to find out if they gave you the correct number on your retirement eligibility service. They do usually have that correct, but um, that's, if, if you don't have enough retirement eligibility service, you can't start it early, unfortunately. Let's take a couple more and continue on. I've never cashed my AMR gifted stock. Can I assess it at any time or do I have to cash out before my retirement date? You can access it at any time by going to that um, CompuShare account. Uh, we have a link uh, or a uh, URL in the back of our uh, retirement handbook. And uh, at some point, they're going to start making you pay a service fee for them holding onto those shares for you. And at that point, you just reach out to them and say, hey, roll it over to E-Trade or Scott Trade or one of those, those free or cheap uh, stock accounts. Following up on Quipsa, QPSA, right? Mm -hmm. I said that right. Okay, Quipsa. Is the 50% automatic and not required? Correct. The 50% that, is automatic if you've been married for at least 12 months. Correct. No deathbed marriages. So you don't have to have a clips on file if you only want your spouse to get 50% going and survivor annuity. But if there's no really downside to doing the form and letting them get the 100% because while other work groups get charged for that privilege, uh, APFA and no negotiated that the legacy AA pension holders get that free of charge. So there's no charge for the AA people. I mean, for the legacy AA flight attendants. How do I make sure that I have the form on file for my pension in case I am hit by a bus? I think they're talking about the Quipsa form. And uh, you go to the pension service center, like you're going <laughs> to pull up a uh, pension estimate. And at some point in that process, you get these two blue links. One says plan specific data, and the other one says get my pension estimate. Well, you clicked on that get my pension estimate First. because that's what you wanted. Uh, go back and click on the plan specific data and you're going to get this little string that says, hey, you have this many years of vesting service, this many years of retirement eligibility service, this many years of credit, years of credited service. And oh, by the way, you have a CUPSA form on file for Bozo and, uh, you know, two or three quadros, how many ever divorces you had that they have the forms for. 
So there's a little chart that has all of that information. Right. If you think they're supposed to have it and they don't, reach out to them now because you're going to be busy when it comes time to actually start your pension. So get that taken care of now. Extension 8490 is the extension for the retirement specialist here at APFA. I'm sending um, your extension over to the IOD individual. Okay. Um, I have more questions. Yeah, just. Okay. just I will do my best to help them out. Okay. Uh, I missed the gentleman's idea about deterring last vacation pay to our 401k. The idea about deferring the last vacation pay to our 401k. First of all, gentlemen, I'm I'm like, what are you talking about? I, yeah. I didn't think Josh said anything about that. Him but okay. All right. Um, the the trick is you want to get your last check to have as much as possible dumped into your 401k. So the day after your second to last check comes in. Uh, you want to go into the Fidelity website and go to the contributions page and say, hey, take 98% of my check or 95% of my check and put it into the 401k. And then when that last check comes with all that vacation pay and everything on it, it'll all 95% will get dumped into your 401k. I suppose you're going to do 100%, but then you're going to owe people money. So don't do that. It'll just make you crazy. All right, last one. Uh, you mentioned pensions are as good as they'll get in age 60. I pulled up different scenarios for when to take it, different ages. And with the level income option, it does change a little bit. Is this correct? It does show the SLA option remains the same. And, and the SLA remembers the normal form of benefit. So that's what we're usually talking about. And the SLA does not change after age 60. The joint and survivor and the level income both change depending on what age you start that and the age of your joint annuitant or your spouse. So, and it doesn't have to be your spouse. Your joint annuitant can be anyone. It can be your spouse, it can be your sister, it can be me, H A N C O C K. Um, so, yeah, uh, those do change because you got to remember we're now talking about how long is my spouse going to draw it after I'm dead? Well, the longer you wait, the number changes. All right, we're good to come along. All right. Thank you for covering us. You're welcome. Medical insurance options. Oh boy. I think heart. this is you. I get to talk about all the fun stuff <laughs> like insurance. All right, so options for medical insurance. Once you've retired, we've got COBRA. Pretty expensive. The AA retiree medical insurance, even more expensive than Super COBRA. Expensive. Look at those dollar signs. Yeah, silly expensive. Then we've got uh, the Affordable Care Act, depending on the state you live in, it can be inexpensive to relatively expensive. So um, do your research. And Medicare, moderately expensive. It's always more than we want it to be, but it's still the best option and the only option if you're eligible for Medicare, unless your spouse is still working and you can be on their insurance. Or the old fashioned way, you can marry someone with insurance, or die young, but really that's not an option. We're not doing that. So we're gonna talk about COBRA, in particular the VIOP COBRA, which is, we like to call it active rate COBRA. So under the VIOP, if you're a VIOP participant, you can continue your COBRA. Um, if, if you're one of these people who are retiring on April 1st with the 12 month VIOP, each VIOP, entitled people to 30 months of medical benefits. And under this, this particular VIOP, your first 12 months of those medical benefits were your active benefits while you were still on payroll for 12 months. So if you retire on April 1st under the VIOP, you are entitled to another 18 months of what they call active rate COBRA. So it's COBRA, but they've reduced the rate you pay to, to equal the active rates that employees are paying, plus a 2% admin fee. So good thing about uh, COBRA is it allows you to continue your active health insurance and you don't have to reestablish your deductible or your out-of-pocket max. That's a great thing. Um, the, if you took the VIOP, you pay the active employee rate and, and that rate could go up at the end of the year when the active rates go up. So. It's not like you're going to lock it in at the rate when you're retired. Um, 
The coverage lasts, will last for 18 months. Um, it can last for longer if you were to become eligible for Social Security disability while you're on the COBRA. Um, or until you're eligible for Medicare, because as we've mentioned before, COBRA is always secondary to Medicare. So if you're eligible for Medicare because of your age or your disability status, even though on paper you're technically eligible for this additional 18 months of COBRA medical benefits, that's going to be secondary and Medicare's and COBRA is going to pay as though you have Medicare, whether or not you've signed up so you'll need to sign up for Medicare if you're eligible for Medicare. Um, COBRA must be elected within the first 60 days uh, after you're retired. If you miss that window, it's a one shot deal and they're not going to offer it to you again. So make sure, um, as I've mentioned before, the best case scenario is to go online on the retirees website and uh, go to benefits and Benefits Service Center and probably about you know, 48 hours to five days after your retirement, the COBRA elections information should be loaded in there. Um, if you like, you can wait for them to send you a packet in the mail, but most people are a little twitchy about not having insurance for you know, two or three weeks while they're waiting for that to happen. So, all right, so more COBRA information. COBRA can include medical, dental, vision, and your healthcare FSA, you get to pick and choose. So if you're Medicare eligible, you know you need to sign up for Medicare, but you can continue your dental and vision with COBRA. That's a good thing about COBRA. If your spouse is not eligible for Medicare, but you are, you can continue your medical for your spouse, but not for you, and dental and vision for both of you. That is an option. Um, once the coverage begins, it's retroactive to the date that you retired. So say you signed up two weeks after your retirement, they're gonna retro it back to April 1st as your COBRA start date, and it will be as though you never lost your coverage. Payments, um, it's very important to make your pay payments in a timely manner. A lot of people set up direct debit um, because they will drop you if you miss a payment. So try not to be late on your payments, just don't do it. Don't even try, just don't do it. All right, um, also RHRA for the VIOP people. Um, you can claim these uh, premiums for RHRA reimbursement. You can't swipe your card and pay your COBRA, but they, the COBRA premiums are eligible to be reimbursed from the RHRA. So you would use your Smart Choice app and show that you paid your COBRA, and then you'll get reimbursed. Um, by the RHRA, which is a great thing. So you wouldn't want to use your FSA or RHRA card anyway, because that doesn't give you advantage models. <laughs> use a different card. There you, and, go. there you go. Patrick's always got an angle. All right. So COBRA and Medicare, as I mentioned before, it, um, if you're eligible for Medicare, COBRA is not considered creditable coverage as an alternative for Medicare, and it's always only going to pay as though you have Medicare anyway. So if you're eligible for Medicare, you need to sign up for Medicare unless you have another source of insurance, for instance, for instance, through your spouse or something, or you get a new job with great insurance. COBRA is always secondary to Medicare. All right, so retiree medical insurance. This is the one that we used to pre-fund for, and then that got ruined by the bankruptcy. It is still an option though, but it's really, really expensive. You have to be between 55 and 65. At the time of retirement, you have to be eligible for the 65 point plan in order to qualify. Um, the participant pays the full cost for this insurance and the price is uncapped. It varies a lot from year to year, very unstable, not good for people on a fixed income in retirement. So how much does it cost? Well, it's great coverage to start out with. It's about it, like the old standard medical plan that we used to have at LAA. 150 and, deductible. 150 deductible, $1,000 out of pocket max. That's a great coverage, you know. However, for 2022, $1,800.26 per month. Ouch. So. Um, it would be eligible for the RHRA, so you're, if you want to use it for that and 
you know, that this is an option if you're not yet eligible for Medicare and you need insurance. So you could get reimbursed for a few years, six months, maybe that wouldn't be too bad, you know, but um, it is expensive. So, all right, ah, our emotional support big animal has uh, fainted at these costs. And I'm just about to faint too, because it's really expensive. So what are other options? We've got the Affordable Care Act, it's still around, stay tuned. You know, we're in a, uh, an administration that's trying to pump it up and not uh, get rid of it, but that goes back and forth, you know. Go to www.healthcare.gov to see what plans are available in your state. Um, you might be eligible for tax credits because it's you're getting a low, you have, you're at a lower income level. Um, that's a possibility. Uh, VIA Benefits is a company that AA contracts with, and they can help you find plans on the Affordable Care Act if you're not yet eligible for Medicare. They can also help you find Medicare plans if you are eligible for Medicare. So we've got the numbers here and also in the APFA retirement packet. Medicare, so as we mentioned before, if you're of Medicare age or if you're eligible because of a prior disability, you do need to go ahead and sign up for Medicare. Um, employees, oh, it, but if you're still working and you haven't yet retired, we want to mention that um, to, if you turn 65 while you're still employed, you don't have to sign up for Medicare. Most people go ahead and sign up for Medicare Part A while they're still employed because there's no cost associated with that. Um, so normal Medicare consists of Medicare Part A, which is as I mentioned, no cost associated with it. That's the hospitalization portion. Um, part B, which is your regular doctor's visits and labs and so on, specialist visits. And part D, which is your um, prescription drug benefit. Why they separate it all out like this, I don't know. They just like to make it more complicated for us. Um, if you don't sign up for Medicare in time, after you retire, there you could be subject to late enrollment fees. So it's very important to sign up for Medicare in a timely manner. And uh, in addition to that, if you're over age 65 at the time of your retirement, you're going to need to get a form filled out by the company. It's called the Medicare L564, which is also known as the Employment Verification Form. You fill out the top of this form, send it to AA, they fill out the bottom of the form saying that you've had insurance. And when you go sign up for a Med Medicare past the age of 65, as long as you have that form, two things are going to happen. You're going to be entitled to, to what is called a special enrollment period for Medicare, and you're not going to be assessed any late enrollment penalty. All right, so here's a copy of the form just so you can see what it looks like. Um, if you like, it's av available on Medicare.gov. I think AA has it on JetNet in their retirement section, and I have it on the APFA website. And, and if I don't have it on the APFA website, I can email it to you. I always keep a current copy of it. All right, more about Medicare. Um, in addition to your regular basic core Medicare, which is the A, B, and D, um, you're going to need to sign up for a Medicare supplement plan um, because with the regular core Medicare benefits, you, you don't have an out-of-pocket max. And in order to limit your spending with Medicare, what you need to sign up for is a Medicare supplement plan, which is also known as a Medigap plan. Um, there are 10 different Medigap plans available from Medicare. Um, in addition to that, there's an 11th option, which is a Medicap VIBA, which is a trust that was set up by retired airline employees, and uh, it's specifically for retired airline workers. So if you want to look into that, I can give you more information about it. Or it's, there's some information on the APFA web website under the retirement page. Um, Part C Advantage plans are another option for your Medicare to limit your spending. Um, they're structured more like an HMO. And if you sign up for a Medicare Advantage plan, you're going to get all kinds of little perks and you don't have to pay for Medicare Part D separately. However, they're, because they're structured more like an HMO, they may be really great in large metropolitan areas and 
may not have as many options if you're out in the country or planning to retire in another country. So um, I would talk to a Medicare advisor and let them know what your plans are in order to choose the best plan for you. Okay, so I mentioned they're structured like an HMO and to consult a Medicare advisor, I'm ahead of myself. So once again, more information about Medicare is available at www.medicare.gov. All right, so we've covered a lot of important questions here today. What do you need to retire? What do you get in retirement? In addition to that, what do you get if you're retiring with the VOP? Also, we're going to cover a little odds and ends here at the end of our presentation. What else do I need to research? So some things you might want to research is, are the RHRA if you took the VOP, life events, optional insurance such as uh, accident insurance, pet insurance, Hyatt Legal, dental insurance, your flex spending accounts, how does that work when you retire? So life events. An important thing to remember if you're planning to go on your spouse or your partner's um, benefits when you retire is that your retirement begins their life event to add you to their benefits. So generally speaking, they have 30 days to file a life event and add you to their insurance coverage. So if that's the, what you have planned to cover your insurance and in retirement. If you're married to another AA employee, remember that even though you had AA insurance prior and you're going on their AA insurance, it's going to be considered a different plan. So you're going to have to do a new deductible and out-of-pocket match. All right, the RHRA. So both you and your spouse or domestic partner are eligible to use the RHRA and your dependents um, for expenses such as uh, medical, dental, vision, and prescription coverage. We're getting good feedback on the RHRA from the people with the previous VA ops that have already retired. They say it's pretty good and they're, they're liking getting free health insurance, basically, even though you have to jump through a few hoops to get reimbursed. Um, you can use your RHRA fund for certain premiums, for example, Medicare and COBRA premiums. Um, some long-term care premiums are eligible, um, but however, life insurance premiums and accident insurance premiums, we've had some people ask about those because I, some people took the AFLEC policies that were uh, offered to APFA members and some people took the AA added benefits policy such as hospital indemnity and accident insurance and critical illness insurance. And although you can use that money you would get from those policies for medical expenses, they're not really linked to a certain code like, you know, it's a cash benefit. So those unfortunately don't qualify for the RHRA. Um, the general rule of thumb is if it's tax deductible, um, you can claim it as an expense for your RHRA. All right, so using the RHRA, you use it with a smart choice debit card. And usually for smaller things, such as a prescription at the drugstore, you can swipe the card and it will go through and you'll be reimbursed right away, like using a credit card almost. Um, however, for certain things like your premiums and higher out-of-pocket expenses, you're gonna to have to submit proof that you paid for it before you can get reimbursed. Um, for eligible healthcare premiums, you can submit a bank statement or um, a credit card statement showing that the premium has been paid. And the company, for if you took the VF, they're gonna send you some information about using the RHRA and how to prove that you've paid for something. So for Medicare premiums, you would submit a social security statement showing the premium's been paid. Um, if you're paying for Medicare and you're not yet drawing your social security or waiting till age 70 or something, um, then you're gonna have to send in a Medicare invoice or receipt showing that you've paid for it. All right, more about using RHRA. So for providers that could be selling you an ineligible service, such as your dentist, you could get teeth whitening, your optician, you could get sunglasses that aren't prescription, 
um, dermatologist a face peel if it's not for a skin cancer or something like that. So something that could be considered elective. You go to the drugstore to get a prescription, but you could also get Bud Light, you know, at the drugstore. So. But my brother-in-law claims that is medicinal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not for the RHRA. So if, you know, you may get some queries about certain charges if it's not clear that it's for an eligible expense. So just be prepared, you know, to, to explain or have provide information, documentation to show that it was an eligible expense. Um, so receipts is kind of annoying to keep all these and be able to prove it. However, you know, it's tax-free money. And like I said, everybody's pretty much really happy with the RHRA and how it's working for them, except in a few circumstances. And if you do have problems with the RHRA and expenses, uh, let me know and I can email somebody in HR and we can try and get to the bottom of it. All right, more about using your RHRA. If you pass away first, your spouse or domestic partner is still entitled to have access to that balance and any dependent children. If you don't have a spouse and you have dependent children, your RHRA cannot pass to your dependent children, unfortunately. Um, the RHRA will roll over from year to year until it's depleted. So there's no time limit on using your RHRA funds. Um, if you're rehired by American, your RHRA balance would be frozen. However, if you have an RHRA at the moment, you sign something that said you wouldn't be rehired, so that's probably not going to happen, but hey, the airline's desperate for bodies, so you never know. If you're rehired by American Airlines, I, the question is why? But no, <laughs> um, there's just a totally unrelated observation that the RHRA will also uh, pay for individual counseling. So just, <laughs> if you decide to get if rehired, you, decide to get rehired you might need America, counseling. Yeah, you might need counseling. <laughs> All right, your RHRA cannot be combined with any other savings or spending account. However, I think there's one exception that uh, PLUS plan, if you signed up for it and you're one of these April VIOP people um, and you did your health incentive things, you know, you got your doctor's visit and so on, I think that's the one exception where those funds will be rolled into your RHRA. Because they are in an RHRA account. Right. Um, Already. You, you will also have the um, HRA account, uh, if you took that plus, because they put some in one account and some in the other, and you can have them both, they just don't combine them. So you'd have to specific, and, and if you have an HSA that you've been building, because you've been in the core plan, you still have that money, they just don't put them all in the same bucket. So if you're going to make a claim, you have to decide which account you're going to make the claim on. And the flex spending, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a separate animal. So optional insurance includes MetLife, long-term care, Hyatt Legal, pet insurance, accident insurance, home and auto policies. And all of these things can be continued. You just have to reach out to the administrator within 30 days of your retirement. Actually, I think it might be 60 days, but do it in 30 days just to be sure. And let them know that you wanna be direct billed and you can keep all of these policies if you'd like to. For your life and accident insurance, it will end. However, you're, you have the option to port or convert your life insurance that was provided by the company and the additional um, life insurance if you bought up um, into an individual policy. And you have 60 days to port or convert your life insurance after your retirement date. Um, you would need to reach out to MetLife who administers the life insurance. And the contact information is on JetNet, and it's also in the back of our retirement packet. Um, it doesn't. Re a good thing about this is it doesn't require a physical exam to, to qualify. And you know we're getting old, and you might not pass a physical exam. Yay! Hey, uh -huh. I resemble that remark. <laughs> contact MetLife for the life insurance and uh, Lina if you want to order convert your AD and D, our voluntary personal accident insurance. It is expensive though, and you do have the option with the life insurance to port a portion of the life insurance and not necessarily the full value of what you have when you retire. Um, Long-term and short-term disability will end. However, if you have an ongoing policy, say you filed a claim prior to your retirement, you're being paid disability benefits, 
those benefits could continue as long as you remain disabled per the provisions of that policy. So even though you retire, disability benefits can continue beyond retirement. Dental insurance, ah, this is scary because unfortunately the options are limited for dental insurance once you retire, which is ridiculous and it's gotta change. Um, so MetLife offers dental insurance. That's our retiree quote dental insurance and the company will offer you retiree dental insurance, but it's really not a great product and most people don't take it. Most people do continue their dental with COBRA for as long as they can, which is 18 months. So um, other options for dental, once the COBRA runs out, a, a credit union has a dental club and Costco has a similar product. It's a network of doctors that give you a discount if you're part of the club. So it's not really insurance, but it does offer you some cost breaks. It, and a lot of people say it works very well. Another option, go to dental schools, be a guinea pig. Let them experiment on you. When the bleeding stops, you'll look great. <laughs> but actually I have a friend that's gone to a dental school and she says she got great, great dental care from the dental school. And there's always a, a qualified dentist supervising. So also some of the Medicare supplement plans have finally started op offering some dental riders. So we have a little bit more and hopefully it will get better. I don't know why they don't just make uh, dental a component of Medicare, but we'll have to get on our politicians about that. It's in the Build Back Better Bear. <laughs> there you go. And another thing is in there that we that we want the HCTC. Yeah. But that's coming up. All right. So flex spending accounts. So normally in a year, what we say about flex spending accounts is if you don't use it, you lose it. So if you have to use your flex spending in a calendar year, you have to use all of what you put in there or, or only $500 will roll over to the next year. When you retire, there's another way, another angle on the flex spending accounts. And that is if you use it, say you're retiring in April, you're a VOP person, you've been on payroll, you opted to put the full amount in your flex spending account, that's easy to say, and you use it all before you retire. So all of the, you've only made deposits between January and April, or January and March really, because you're retiring on April 1st, you use the whole year's worth, you retire, AA has to eat the rest. They lose it. They lose it and you use it all and they lose it. So April people, if you haven't used up your flex spending, you still have time. You've got a little over a month, make some doctor's appointments. Use every bit in that flex spending account before you retire. And you don't have to cover the cost of the additional deposits for the rest of the year. The company will eat that. Okay, so any more questions? We've about reached the end of our presentation. Yes, and we've got a few. We're reaching the end of our two hour session, so we can get through these pretty quickly. Can I use my health card to pay for my COBRA premiums? If yes, what's the steps do I need to take to make it possible? Okay, so we've mentioned that earlier. You can use your RHRA to be reimbursed for the COBRA premiums. You can't swipe the card and pay for the COBRA premiums with the card. Can you share the website we will need to log on to after our retirement date to sign up for COBRA? www.retirees.aa.com. It's the retirees website where you'll go for travel, for your paycheck information, and to sign up for COBRA and any other benefits you're eligible for upon retirement. And in that same, uh, uh, one of our other flight attendants message in just to let you guys know, they did push us off to JetNet and put us on retiree.aa.com. Yes, thanks for reminding That was my mistake. I, I knew that, but I, <laughs> I kind of forgot. <laughs> There's so much knowledge, yeah, okay. Uh, what is a good age to retire if you want to pay COBRA for a bit until age eligible for Medicare? Oh, that's easy. You're eligible for Medicare at 65 minus 18 months is 63 and a half. You would be surprised how many people retire at 63 and a half because they know they can get 18 months COBRA, go to Medicare and they're done. And a lot of people do that. And also, we've been talking a lot about the VIOP COBRA. But I just want to throw out there because there's probably some people listening who didn't take the VIOP that the cost of the regular COBRA is the full cost. Uh, the VIOP people qualified for active rate COBRA 
Um, the full cost is, uh, what, what was it this year, 1700 so Yeah, like 1700 a month. A month. So the full cost for COBRA is expensive, but if you look out there at what's available, sometimes it's still the best option. Yeah. And we do have the current COBRA costs in our retirement package for 2022, the full cost. <laughs> How does the social security offset work and can this be getting gotten part of can this be getting rid of gotten rid of um so the social security offset was a a way that the uh, management figured out to screw us out of part of our pension they the said, legacy us the well, legacy us Air, uh airways pensions and um they said, okay, we've been making contributions to your pension. We've also been making contributions to Social Security. You're double dipping. We're going to take some of the pension back when you're eligible for that Social Security. They don't care if you start your Social Security. They were just trying to figure out a way to reduce the pension. Um, the, that got into the contracts. And then um, the uh, AFA folks worked really hard and did some great negotiating mm -hmm. to get that out of there, got rid of it. Uh, four months, uh, four years after they got rid of it, the pensions went to the PBGC, and the PBGC said, "Hey, we got you covered. As long as you haven't made any changes in the last five years." And we're like, "Oh crap! Yeah, mm -hmm. that was four years ago." So they revived the Social Security offset. I called the zombie screw you because they we got killed by screw you, and then it was revived. And uh, it now only twenty percent of what the screw you used to be, but. Uh, that is already baked in there. When you pull up your PB or get your PBGC pension estimate, based on the year you told them you wanted to start and the year you, uh, how old you are at this point, um, the numbers are already in there with that Social Security offset. I would love to be able to get rid of it, but we got nothing to do with PBGC. There's no way to to get them to take it back out. And if we were to negotiate with American and say, hey, you got to take it back out, they've got nothing to do with the PBGC. They're, it's gone, that, that pension is over there. We have no control over what happens to it over there. I have a 65 point plan question. Okay. I began flying in June, 2013. When am I able to retire with the 65 points? My age is over 55 years. Do you mind if I try this one? You can try this I one. I started doing that. Okay. Yes. So June 2013, and it's 2020 now. Uh, so 2022. June, so 2022. <laughs> and June of this year, that'll be nine years of service. Okay. You say you're over 55, but we can just assume you're 55 right now, and then you can add on the years. You have to have 10 years. You have to have 10 years of service. So that puts you at 64 points, 64 as of June. So if you're older than 55, then you might have already. Well, except point. she's got she to, have to have the 10, 10 years, years. So once you hit June. June of 2023. Right. 13, she's got to have 10 uh, years. Because it's got to have 10 years. There's yeah. an age component. Okay. So your age plus your years of service have to equal 55 or more. So but you also have to, 65 or more. But you also have to have the 10, 10 years, years of company seniority. So ignore the math. You're you're good as of June of 2023. 2023. Right. Yeah. Hang on, baby. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> Hang good. on for another year and some. And that helped me understand. The <laughs> there you go. Yeah, because I talked to somebody yesterday that was in the same predicament. Her age plus her years of service equals 65 or more, but she did not yet have the 10 years of yeah. company seniority. In her case, she had to wait till. 2024 until uh -huh. she would be eligible. <laughs> All right, April 2022 VIA. Do I have to spend my FSA prior to April 1st? If you want to get the full benefit of it before you retire, yes. If you want, don't mind. Uh, I mean, you've only made what January, three February, months. three months worth of deposits, so you should spend at least that much of it, and that way you won't lose it. If you don't use the full amount, before, as long as you equal your three months worth of deposits and spending, you're fine. But if you want to maximize your benefit and let AA pay for a lot of that, then use it all up before, if you if you can. If if for some reason you can't use it and you've got that three months worth of deposit in there, let's call it I don't know, thousand dollars. We'll call it five hundred dollars. Say you've got that five hundred dollars in there, you will lose it if you retire on April 1st and haven't used it, mm -hmm. except we figured out a backdoor thing. You can COBRA it 
for however long it takes you to use up that five hundred dollars, and you got to pay for it under Cobra. But you you use it up and then stop paying for it. You can you can Cobra your FSA. However, the deposits you're making into your FSA when you do that are post tax, not pre tax, because right. you don't have any income for them to be deducted out of. So that's somewhat negates the benefit but if you've already put money in there and you want to use it that's a way to continue yeah, you're much better off to use it up and overuse it max it out between now and april 1st. and really you have time still yeah I'm telemedicine telemedicine <laughs> <laughs> i'm continuing coverage with aflac after the separation date does the eligibility to participate in the apfa group rates continue in future years and or for the duration of cobra eligibility COBRA has nothing to do with AFLAC. And yes, it, your, your, your rates will continue at the rates you started them, you know, with AFLAC, although there's age banding for some of the products and you might have to check with the APFA Health Department on this. If you reach a certain age, your rate may increase just because of that. But I mean, your, your AFLAC products should not change other than that you're gonna be direct billed for those. And it's not going to happen automatically. You need to contact the AFLAC folks to set that up. That's good enough. Does $10,000 for employees who die go with us once retired? Does it go to our heirs to bury us and party on what's left over? Uh, I'm missing something. <laughs> um, we don't have a $10,000 per employee death anymore. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, you're not getting buried and they're not partying because that, that benefit isn't there. But they will give you a discount on shipping your remains somewhere. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that information is in the trip book. So print up the trip book before you retire, right. although you can access the trip book through the retirees website. I was one. Um, go back to that one. What do you mean we don't have to restart our deductible? So if we met our deductible in 2021, it doesn't start over this year at zero? No, no, if you're mid-year and you switch from your plan to your spouse's plan, you're new in their plan, you have a new deductible. Even though you met your deductible American at IBM, you have it, so you got a new deductible. Or even if your, employee, your spouse is another AA employee, you met your AA deductible, but in, in uh, April when you switched to theirs, you're new again, so now you've got a new deductible. But However, it, if I take COBRA, I get to keep my plan. And in my plan, I've already met my deductible, so I don't have to meet it again. Uh, I am paying the COBRA rates, but if you're uh, VOP, uh, you're paying active rates. So it just, it's a no-brainer that you want to stay on that COBRA if you can. You're not over 65 um, because you don't have a new deductible to meet. That's clear. So if you're on COBRA, you're continuing your exact same coverage. If you've already met your deductible, you don't have to meet it again. But if you switch to a different plan, a different plan will trigger a new deductible and out-of-pocket max. I think we've touched on this, but it'll be good to repeat again. Are we able to use the 150000 HSA to pay for COBRA? Yes. All right, sorry. All right, sorry. Yep. Wait. So that's another thing we need to do right after retirement, sign up for COBRA. Could you please repeat that? So even though we enrolled last fall, we need to do something again right after April 1st. Can you please clarify? Yes, you enrolled in active benefits last fall. When you retire, your active benefits will end. Your retirement is your trigger to be offered COBRA. So your COBRA benefits offering will be generated once you retire. And you have two options for getting on COBRA. You can wait for them to send you a packet in the mail. I think they have 30 days to generate it and another 15 days to mail it out to you. Doesn't usually take that long, but rather than wait for a packet to come in the mail, which isn't really reliable these days, um, a better option is to go onto the retirees website and then you click on benefits and benefits service center and you go in there and you will be prompted if you're eligible for COBRA to uh, make your COBRA elections and set up your payment arrangements. And if you need help, you can call the benefits service center at the same old number with AA because they administer the COBRA and they also administer the RHRA if you're a, a, a VIOP person. 
How do we set up automatic COBRA payments? You contact Alight and they'll help you figure that out. And so to even usually a direct debit. It's usually a direct debit from your bank account that most people do. How do we set up COBRA again? Also, I thought the RHRA payment method didn't start as a method until after the 18 month, 18 month period after infant first. No, the RHRA starts as of your retirement. As of your retirement date, you're eligible to start using the RHRA. And how do they sign up for COBRA? They go to the AP, the, uh, the re retirees website, click on benefits, and go to the benefits service center. Do you have to sign up for the hundred fifty thousand medical dollars with the VOP, or do they automatically issue the money in that account? Well, not everybody gets one hundred fifty thousand. There's a sliding scale depending on your age when you retire. So if you're um, 60 or younger, you get 150,000, and then it's gradual up from there. You may get 100, 110, 120, but whatever you're eligible for will automatically be input into the retirees website under the benefits section, and you can see your RHRA balance there, and you can see it go down as you submit expenses. So that that that's how you can track it. Also, there were a handful of people who retired in October who, you know, say they were 60 and and then went on October 1st and then they turned 61 and they got the wrong amount put in their RHRA. Um, if that happens for some reason, your birthday is like on April 2nd and then they give you a lesser amount because of that, you can contact Alight or you can contact me and I'll contact HR in order to get that corrected. If I have a gap of three years between ending active rate COBRA from VOP until I can go on Medicare, what are my options for insurance? Do I have to go on AA retiree plan? You do not have to go on the AA retiree plan. It is an option. Um, another option is the Affordable Care Act plans um, and get a, get a job like at uh, um, what are good employers. Starbucks. I've heard Starbucks. You Starbucks. can work part time as long as you're work a certain number of hours that they have really good benefits. You're going to bust your butt serving people like you did on the airplane, but hey, for good benefits, it might be worth it. And all the macchiato you can drink. And all the macchiato you can drink or uh, what other employers have I heard are good out there? Um, Costco, Home Depot, um, Trader Joe's. Those are just some of the ones I've heard that offer good benefits. To part-timers. To part-timers. Went to the pension service center to get the forms. Do I complete the enhanced pre-retirement survivor annuity form as well as the beneficiary designation for AMS, TWU, and FAA? Okay, the uh, the beneficiary designation it most likely doesn't apply to you. Uh, it applies to a very small handful. I mean, literally probably 20 people, 20 flight attendants. Um, if you fill it out and it doesn't apply to you, they won't do anything with it. They won't yell at you. They'll just go, this doesn't apply. But you definitely want to fill out that QPSA form if you're not starting your pension right away. Because the second you start your pension, that pre-retirement form you just filled out stops dead because you're no longer pre-retirement. And, and the, the form is misnamed. It says pre-retirement. It really means pre-pension. Mm -hmm. So you can retire on April 1st and not start your pension for you know four more years. And you definitely want to have that uh, puts a form on file for that four years, uh, but uh, and there's you, no downside to filling no downside. it out yeah. um, and sending it in. Don't send it in the same envelope with your pension paperwork because uh, it will just confuse them. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. On VF, do I need to put in for Cobra or is it automatically roll over? We've covered that, but yeah. you do need to sign up for Cobra. And you need to go to the retirees website. Yeah, I think some people were popping in and out. And as a reminder, everyone, this is recorded. So if there is some information that you may have missed, we encourage you to go back and watch the video. When do you receive RHRA cards after you file for package? Receive your, they're going to automatically, well, if you already have a smart choice card because you have an FSA, you will use the same card for your RHRA and it will be activated for the RHRA. 
if you don't have some other kind of a health spending account that has a problem, then they will mail you. And it's usually within 30 days of your retirement date that you would receive that card. All right, last couple. This one is back to the AFLAC. Bless you. <laughs> okay. Um, can we participate in future years after separation? That might be a health question. You can continue what you have. I don't think you can sign up for new coverage once you leave the, bar, uh, the sponsoring organization, which is APFA. The health department has had some discussion with AFLAC about offering benefits to our retirees. However, they haven't been able to offer the same favorable rates that they, they offered to the active employees. So at this point, that hasn't happened, but um, it could Stay happen tuned. in the future. Right. So the Benefits Service Center can help us with getting set up with our RHRA. What is that number again? The Benefits Service Center number. I don't have it right in front of me. It's... Um, I want to say 800 447 No, that's not it. <laughs> if you call 800 447 they it can bump you over to the Benefits Service Center. Um, you have the packet. So call us or call the health department and we will get you that number. Yeah. It's also on JetNet under the benefits section of JetNet and or since, the retiree site. Right. And since I know you're all rushing over to the APFA website to download the retirement packet, it is also in the last few pages of that retirement packet and the retirement packet is where on the website it's on the retirees the retirement page however it's not on there right now because oh. i had a few, oh, yeah. okay. few additional edits that's right, so that's it's right. going to be back on there in the next day or so not seeing the link on retirees.a.com for retiree package question mark because the retiree packet that we're referring to is the apfa retirement packet yeah. if you go to retirees.aa.com and then team member services can you get to their retirement guide or do they assume you've already retired and say you don't need it i think you can only get to the pension service center i don't think you can get to the retirement guide so call us and if if you're on the re only have access to the retirees website we'll send you the apfa retirement packet and if you want we will send you a printout of the aa retirement guide as well all right, last one. Um, back to AFLOC. Does that mean coverage is over as of separation on 4 1, even if I enrolled for 2022? If you have current coverage, you can continue your current coverage with AFLOC. You, the only one you can't continue is the um, short term disability, or is it long term disability that they offer? They offer a disability. SCD, you can't, you can't. You can't continue the disability benefit because it's based on disability from working. If you're getting another job and you tell them that you're getting another job, you can continue the disability. Um, everything else you can continue. You just have to contact the AFLAC administrator and set up direct bill for those benefits. Well, that is all the time we have today. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions. Um, we sincerely wish you the best on your retirement journey, getting all your documents taken care of um, and everything settled and ready for that good slide. Give us a call if you have questions or need any more information and good luck everybody. Take care. Congratulations on your retirement. Bye.